Well, the, it, was, it was a radically different kind of theatre from what we're used to because it actually evolved out of the habit of the early acting companies travelling around the country, putting a booth stage in a marketplace and then acting all around. And the point about that is it was what I would call three-dimensional acting rather than the two-dimensional acting, which we tend to be used to now. I mean, two-dimensional acting is absolutely dominant these days, and we suffer from it, I think, in all sorts of ways, including at the New Globe, where they've forgotten about the importance of acting all the way around. Um, the point was that the theatres were all designed, in effect, in the round because hearing had a priority over seeing, and you had to be within earshot rather than eye, uh, eye shot of the of, of of the actors, and that's why that's in effect why the globe was round. Why all the theatres in those days were designed on the assumption that if you could get close enough, you could hear everything. So it was very intimate theatre because, of course, the audience got as close as possible to the actors. They were never held apart by the proscenium march or anything. It's also true that we have been totally conned, as it were, into thinking in terms of two-dimensional acting ever since. Because, for instance, to talk about front stage and backstage, that's two-dimensional thinking. You're thinking of the stage as a picture and everybody standing on one side looking into it. Um, that's, that's actually not at all what the original stages were like. And they maintained that all the way through till 1642. And then, of course, there was the 18-year break before plays reopened in the Restoration. And then it was... Um, it, was, it became proscenium arch theatre, brought in from France and Italy because the, the, all the royal, royals who were so keen on theatre had been living in exile in France and Italy and had got used to that kind of staging. So um, the, and the Shakespearean stage, this three-dimensional staging, was totally lost during that break. There was some evolution during that 70-odd years of the three-dimensional staging at commercial theatres. I mean, the point about um, the theatre going commercial was the key thing that allowed it to develop. Um, I mean, in a, in a marketplace, you were totally dependent on just taking a hat around and asking people to, to be generous enough to give money in return for the pleasure the actors were giving them. Um, so the first commercial theatres of of, of 1575 and 1576 were built with a wall around the stage. And of course, b being a big wall, they'd sit, they put two or three ranks of galleries up on each side, so you had ample space. Um, and you didn't get into the theatre unless you paid. I mean, the commercial impulse is absolutely basic to all of this. And the, the, um, the evolution, I think, came about partly because the, the standard thing, um, the booth stages, of course, just had a curtained off space where the actors would wait to come on stage and the the commercial theatres built not 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 a curtain booth but a, a permanent frontage with two or three doors to let them in and gradually the value of making an entrance as which is still the casual terminology for 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 theatre activity to make an entrance meant that everybody thought in terms of the tiring house and the actors in front of the tiring house. Now that's beginning of two-dimensional thinking, front and back stage rather than absolute three-dimensional. Of course, once they were out on the stage, then they stood at the very front edge of the stage with the audience literally surrounding them in a fairly symmetrical circle in, in most parts, with, of course, the expensive seats what we would think of as backstage rather than anywhere else. You know, the Lord's Rooms and the Gentlemen's Rooms were all on the side or back of the stage. And we forget too easily that, being democratic, of course, these days, that the people in the yard were the main focus of the, of, of the actors. They spoke to the people in the yard. In fact, they must have spoken to the rich people who were side and backstage. And that was something that was intensified quite quite uh, strongly once the adult actors got hold of the indoor playhouses, the Blackfriars particularly for the Shakespeare Company, and that then they uh, started being aware of the need to act to each side and to the back. So you, you had a reinforcement of the three-dimensional staging, but still you had this sense of everybody making entrance from what we think of as backstage, from backstage through from the tiring house onto the, um, onto the stage. And that's a rather... Um, gradual change that you can see developing. Uh, the, the, there wasn't any scenic, what we would call scenic staging, really two-dimensional things where the actors are standing in front of a, a picture screen. 
Um, that, 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 that never came until the restoration in 1660. But there was, I think, a tendency to focus on exits and entrances. And that, of course, would move people towards thinking of it being pictorial, in a sense, or at least to the degree of being the place where the actors came from and went back into. So it was, it was a gradual seduction. But of course, I mean, seductions like that don't always get fully activated. I mean, we talk now, we still talk now about theatre audiences. An audience, the word audience comes from hearing, not from seeing. If you, were, if, you're, if you came to look, you would be a spectator, not an audience. And we still use the word audience, even though theatre has become totally spectatorial. The commercialization of theatre, which really started in 1575 and 1576, when the first indoor playhouses opened um, for, for profit making, and the um, first outdoor amphitheatre, the, 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 the precursor of the globe, the theatre, was built in, uh, by James Burbage in 1576. And there's no doubt that James Burbage, as, a, as an actor turned impresario, who made loads of money and from from renting out his theatre to the actors, and who eventually established the Shakespeare Company, um, which Shakespeare joined or was who was who was drawn into in in fifteen ninety four, um, you know, fairly early in his career. But he'd already written ten plays by then, and all those plays got into the Shakespeare Company, which is its own curious story. But what really happened was that the essential features of um, acting were determined by the three-dimensionality of the stages and the use of the stages and the fact that everybody wanted to go to the plays. I mean, it, they were huge, it was a hugely profit-making business and the real profiteers were the, uh, the owners of the playhouses, renting them out to the actors. The actors took, took their share, but the, the owners always took half of the gallery profits, which is the most expensive part of the theatre. So they always made a fair share. More than a third of the takings always went to the owners rather than to the, to the actors. So it was a very profitable activity. And James Burbage continued this impresario role that he adopted once he'd given up acting himself. He got his son in, of course, as the lead actor for the Shakespeare Company, Richard Burbage. But the main thing that happened was that the old tradition, um, which had started in the city of London with the city inns, then got converted in 1594, which is a crucial date for all of this. Um, I could go on forever about what happened, in, or what might have happened, must have happened in 1594. It meant that James Burbage was, was pushed by circumstances, mainly the opposition between the government or Privy Council and the Lord Mayor of London, who was dead against plays and did all he could to block them. I mean, bu bureaucracy is the real underlying story in all of this. Um, the bureaucratic conflict there meant that suddenly all the actors were stopped from acting at the inns inside the city and had to act out in the suburbs. And that meant also that the only theatres in the suburbs were the open-air amphitheatres, the big open-air amphitheatres. And clearly the Shakespeare Company, and particularly James Burbage, wanted them to go indoors for the winter. I mean, given London's climate, that's hardly surprising, is it? And uh, that's why, um, first of all, the company got their patron in October 1594, as, as winter was coming on, to ask for leave to to play at the Cross Keys Inn, one of the inns with a big indoor space to act in. Um, and that was blocked by the Lord Mayor, who said, no, no acting inside where I control the city of London itself. And so James Burbage, within a year, had bought the Blackfriars property and built himself, or built for his Shakespeare company, um, a complete indoor playhouse. And that was the beginning of the great change in which the Globe, which was the most popular playhouse when it was first built in 1600, 1599, 1600, was gradually superseded by the Blackfriars because um, summer and winter, uh, they, I mean, it was incredibly self-indulgent of the company to have two playhouses and only use one of them, but they used the Globe in the summer because it was outdoors and you could get a much bigger crowd in, um, and the Blackfriars in, as an indoor venue through the winter. And that was the beginning of you might say, playing, moving indoors. The Blackfriars very quickly became the most fashionable site 
in London. Everybody who was rich and had expensive costumes would come and flaunt them in the audience uh, at the Blackfriars. And, it, and even Queen Henrietta Maria, Charles's queen, went four times to the Blackfriars for an ordinary play. And for a queen actually to go to a theatre instead of having the theatre come to her, which is what Elizabeth always insisted on, that was extraordinary and, and, and quite radical. So the Blackfriars really was the most success, the biggest success story in the whole of this period. And it was the memory of how famous and how popular and indeed how profitable the Blackfriars was that, that generated the, the, the feeling as soon as royalty came back again after that 18 year interval with, with Cromwell uh, in the way, so to speak. Um, it was because of that that, that that royalty insisted on taking over two new, two new playhouses, two new playing companies, and actually renewing the pattern that was started in 1594. I mean, there's something terribly traditional in all of this. And one of the traditions is the commercial impulse. Um, the other tradition is that the, um, the, 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 the uh, old ideas renew themselves. I mean, the, the, the Blackfriars was built because back in 1594, the Shakespeare Company wanted to play indoors in winter. I mean, all very understandable. And that then made the winter playhouse, the Blackfriars, so successful that when they rebuilt the playhouses, there was no question of reopening the amphitheatres. There were amph the Red Bull was still available for use, um, but that was outdoor playing, and that was clearly no longer the desirable thing. So, um, in effect, the whole of, of acting went up market quite drastically, and the rich and the famous, of course, all wanted to be indoors, so only the indoor theatres survived after 1660. What really happened in 1594, I think, was that the Lord Mayor, who had, and, and the, the, the Lord Mayor, most Lord Mayors disliked playing intensely, and they wanted to have it totally excluded from their jurisdiction, which was the City of London. Um, I mean, they, 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 that meant that when James Burbage built the the, the, the theatre, the first of the theatres, he built it in the northern suburbs. And when Philip Henslow built the next theatre, he built it on Bankside, and so, because Surrey and Middlesex were technically outside the Lord Mayor's jurisdiction. And I think that, um, unfortunately, the records of the, from the Lord Mayor um, have disappeared from, from 1593 to 1595, the crucial period. But I think that what happened in 1594, when the Lord Chamberlain and the Lord Admiral set up their two new companies, was that the um, whole idea of excluding them was give, putting them under so much pressure that they decided they'd better give in to the Lord Mayor and ban playing at any of the inns, um, allow the Lord Mayor to ban playing at any of the inns, while they were setting up their two playhouses in the suburbs, one to the north and one to the south, one in Surrey, one in Middlesex. Um, and Clearly the company that was allocated to play in the theatre in, 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 in Middlesex didn't like the idea of not having access to a winter venue in, uh, indoors. So that was why James Burbage was prompted to, um, I think he, pr he first of all got the uh, Lord Chamberlain to ask if they could use the Cross Keys Inn as an indoor venue. And clearly the Lord Mayor, who, who had just been elected, I mean, it, it, um, it's the dating is fascinating because the letter was written on the 8th of October to the Lord Mayor, who was a stand-in Lord Mayor because the Lord Mayor in office had died you know, in, in office. And the next Lord Mayor had been appointed but hadn't taken up his office because he took it up at the end of October at, at, at Michaelmas. Um, so, uh, and, and, and the new Lord Mayor, everybody knew, was violently, absolutely violently against plays. So they, they first of all tried to get the, the, the stand-in Lord Mayor to approve them playing at the Cross Keys, which may, he may have done. You know, the records, unfortunately, aren't there uh, now. Um, but it would have meant that even if he had given permission, the next Lord Mayor would have said no and, and, and banned it. So the company was left with the need to play uh, at the theatre, the outdoor theatre, right through the, that winter. And what James Burbage then did was to build them an indoor theatre in a precinct of London, where the Lord Mayor had no authority. The Blackfriars Precinct, because it had been a monastic precinct, didn't come under the Lord Mayor any more than St Paul's, which is where the other indoor theatre was. I mean, St Paul's was run by the Dean and, and the Blackfriars was simply independent. 
um, it, and it had its own um, control. But they were both free of the Lord Mayor's control. So Burbage went st- made, a, made a beeline for the Blackfriars, where there was a huge hall, which actually had been used for meetings of Parliament under Richard II. It was a great hall. And he, he tore down the seven tenements that then o- occupied it with residents in them um, and, and, and built the... Um, built, built, built a new theatre inside, and this was the end of the thing. I mean, it was, it was a disaster at the time, because um, that in November of 1596, when he just finished and was ready to move his company, the Shakespeare Company, into it, the locals decided this was not a good thing, and they petitioned the Privy Council to have it banned, have playing their band. In fact, the second signatory of that was their own, the Shakespeare Company's own new patron, their, their original patron, Henry Carey, the, 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 the Lord Chamberlain, had obviously supported them building it there. Um, uh, we've got correspondence from him in which he talks about them, them building the playhouse. But he then died in July of 1596, and his son George Carey just happened to live right underneath where the new playhouse was built, which was unfortunate because the NIMBY principle obviously came into process, and that meant that there was no way in which the company could play there. In fact, they, 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 they insinuated them slowly. And it's partly a, a reflection of the increasing power that the companies had um, by being very good and getting massive aristocratic backing. Um, first of all, they were allowed to open a boy company to play there. They rented out James, Richard Burbage, who'd inherited it from James Burbage by then. Uh, Richard Burbage leased it out to um, a boy company and it played there once a week, um, which was far less, as it were, demanding on the local, its neighbours, for, for, for that period. And, and eventually, by 1608, when there was a long closure because of plague, um, the boy company collapsed and disappeared, and the lease was surrendered back to, um, to, the Bur- to Richard Burbage, who then gave it to, to his, his co-owners um, of the globe, including Shakespeare. And, and uh, from then on, the king's men, because they'd become the king's men instead of uh, after Henry Carey and, and then George Carey both died, um, King James, within a month of arriving in London, took on the company and patronised. And this was the beginning of this royal support for playing that, that, that lasted right through until Charles started getting into trouble with Parliament in 1642. So it was something that... Um, happened part, mainly, I think, because of the success of theatre. Theatre was proving so massively successful that uh, everybody wanted to see it. And, and for James to make it, make it his company gave it the absolute maximum protection. There was nothing more the Lord Mayor could do to stop playing. So they were able to play in the Blackfriars. And even in 1608, when the Long Plague break, break came and James needed money from the City of London, and one of the things that he traded with the city in return for a large loan of money was the Blackfriars site. In fact, the Lord Mayor took control of the Blackfriars in 1608. But by then, of course, it was the King's Company. They were absolutely... And they'd been playing there for 10... For, 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 well, they, they hadn't started playing, but the Boy Company had been playing there. So um, the, the King's men actually were able to stay on there. I mean, there were various petitions, further petitions from the locals in 1619 and 1632, um, which, which objected to, you know, the, uh, which re- reutilised the NIMBY principle there. Um, that, was, that, was, that was a massive um, setback, except that the King's men by then were so privileged and so empowered. And the Blackfriars were so massively popular with the whole country that um, it, it, it stayed on. And there, there are lovely stories about the Blackfriars being... I mean, the, the trouble was it was, um, it was in a tight little precinct with narrow streets and lots of trade and so forth. Uh, but if all the grandees came to the Blackfriars to see the plays in coaches. And the, the first ever traffic regulation that, that Britain ever saw came in 1632 when, the, as a result of the petition and so forth, the um, Privy Council was forced to rule that everybody should, uh, their coaches should come to Paul's Yard, St Paul's, which is you know, not, very, not a very long walk from the Blackfriars, and deposit their passengers there and then drive off and park way out of town. Um, and and, and there's, a, there's a very cynical letter about it which says the order was fairly well observed for about three weeks and since then it has lapsed. 
I mean, that sort of thing was always happening there. That, but that reflects the enormous privilege that the Blackfriars had acquired by the 1630s. Everybody was going to. That was when Henrietta Maria, um, as queen, was, was going to performances there then. In a way, you can only judge it by its success because it clearly was vastly popular and was making vast amounts of money. And we've got Henslow's diary, which records his takings at the Rose um, for, and, and names different plays every day. I mean, it was putting enormous pressure on the actors because they had to act a different play every day because the same, actor, the same audiences were coming to the theatre every day and therefore they had to have a novelty as often as possible. I mean, they were putting on a new play every week pretty well and certainly they were, um, they were putting on a different play every, every one of the six days of the week they were allowed to act in. So that was, that was a major pressure on the actors. The real benefit of all of that was that... Um, it made masses of money. I mean, there were major entrepreneurial investments in theatre throughout that period, and and you know a lot of new new theatres. The, the the government tried to regulate the number of theatres. At one point, they uh, in in about 1617, there was an order saying the four companies. In other words, only four companies were licensed to perform. Well, that was twice as much as had been licensed in 1594. So that was obvious sign of growth, and. Um, Things did settle down pretty well, you know, through the later Jacobean and Caroline period. The, the experience of going, I, it became fashionable to be seen at the Blackfriars, and and the the rich um, always went there. I mean, the key determinant of, of of that was that it cost one penny throughout the whole seventy odd years. It only cost one penny to get into the yard at the Globe or the or the Rose or anywhere. Whereas the cheapest price to sit in a gallery at the back, well, if you can call it back when you don't have a back and a front, um, the, the gallery at the back was sixpence. And mostly the charges were much higher than that. It, it cost half a crown, which in the old currency is an eighth of a pound, which is a lot of money, um, uh, to sit in a box alongside the stage at the Blackfriars. And probably almost as much to sit um, at the back of the stage, um, the balcony... <laughs> And over the Francina at the stage, we've we've we've, we've got a, a plan of um, one of the theatres, which may or may not have been built, but but of an indoor theatre at that time, which quite clearly shows all the most expensive seats being round what we would call the sides and back of the stage, um, and and of course everybody in in seats in the middle, um, uh, in in the in the uh, what we think of as the the auditorium side, um, that was that was a, a major thing. We don't. We have occasional evidence from uh, anecdotal evidence from people who would be massively um, taken by plays. There's there's there's, there's the records of um, people going to Dr. Faustus. I call it Faustus, by the way, rather than Faustus, because Faustus was Goethe's intrusion. It's the Germanic pronunciation, but but um, Henslow writes it down as Faustus rather than Faustus. So. Dr. Faustus. Um, there were people so overwhelmed by the experience of him going, being dragged down to hell or whatever happens at the end of the play that they, that, that they were totally um, uh, driven. In fact, the, the, there's a lovely story about a man who was an apprentice and went to the Fortune in 1612 to see a, 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 a revival of Dr. Faustus and was so overwhelmed by it that he went off to church and spent a week praying to, to, to exonerate himself from all his obvious... A past of of sinning grievously as he clearly did, and um, that sort of thing uh, you have. I mean, it was it was a powerful experience always in the powerful plays, and there are more references to, for instance, the Spanish tragedy, which is a very early play, um, in probably about around about the time of the Armada, fifteen eighty seven, fifteen eighty eight, um, and 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 Marlowe's great play Tamburlaine. Um, uh, they ran on right through the whole entire period. They became the, as it were, early classics. I mean, we know they were classics because Johnson was very contemptuous about people whose tastes stick with the Spanish tragedy and Tamburlaine and haven't changed in, in 30 years, etc. Um, Johnson is very rude about people who aren't with it and, and watching his plays, or rather uh, hearing his plays. 
Johnson was very eloquent about the import, the primacy of hearing over seeing, because of course, I mean, it's it's entirely natural. All the writers who who are the ones who have most to say about the audiences, the writers always wanted you to hear their words, not see the actors. So hearing was the absolute, and and there was a sort of bias in the accounts of. Um, of, of the plays through that period. If you look through what Shakespeare said, he talks about audience and auditor up to, a, up to Hamlet. Uh, so the first half of his life, he thought of the audience as listeners. Um, the second half, with Hamlet onwards, he talks about spectators. And of course, he talks very dismissively of spectators who do nothing but come to for what they can see at the plays. But he kept up spectators, and of course, in his last plays, like Winter's Tale with Hermione's statue, um, he deliberately used spectacle and vision as a key feature of the plays. So there were shifts of various kinds, and um, I mean, and, and the same uh, limited evidence is 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 true for the ja the Jacobean and Caroline periods when the Blackfriars became the great plays, because you you get more accounts of people talking to one another and going in order to show themselves off uh, rather than to enjoy the play. Uh, the, there's actually one lovely account by, uh, ostensibly written by a man called Nim. I mean, it, it's, it's a fictional story about a, a rogue who was trying to make lots of money out of his life. And um, he actually invests all of 50 pounds, which was a hell of a lot of money in those days, to buy a very rich and expensive looking cloak that he could wear, and he took it to the Blackfriars, the object being to make some rich lady so attracted and obsessed by him that um, he could make, make money by all the jewels she would give him, uh, as it were. So he goes and he sits on the stage, he sits on a stool on the stage, which is what the most, um, ex mo mo the, the, the gallants who wanted to go to the stage and be seen rather than, than listen to the play, they, they, they sat on the stage, so he sits on the stage and he gets into a talk, talk uh, during the first two, three acts of the play, which obviously he paid no attention to. Um, but the, 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 the um, countryman, a gentleman from the country who was sitting next to him, got so infuriated. Uh, I mean, the story obviously was, was of a woman who was raped off stage, of course, but, you know, it was raped. And he got so furious, he said, if, if, he, if he caught the man who did it, he would, he would stab him immediately, you know. That sort of you know, nonsense. So there were clearly um, people who fell for the story and believed it, unlike Nim. Uh, I mean, Nim ends up, of course, uh, getting a woman in the, in, in the audience who was, um, had a mask over her face, as, many, as most of the women did, because going to a playhouse was, meant going outdoors and you didn't want to get sunburned or do anything. Even in winter, you didn't want to have anything bad to happen to you, so you wore a black mask. That was standard. And, and he saw her eyeing him and so, you know, at the next act break, he stands up and f takes off his cloak and sort of shows himself off. And, and she continues to stare at him after the thing to the end of the play. Um, and, and then um, after the play's ended, she, she sp speaks to a neighbour and takes her mask off. And it, she realises she's, she's the ugliest person he's ever encountered. But I mean, that doesn't stop him. He has this very, very cynical c account of how, you know, jewels and will, make, will make up for anything, and, you know, et cetera. Um, and so he goes, he follows her out of the playhouse down the stairs uh, and out into the street. And unfortunately, she's with her brother, who, who gets offended at, at him accosting her and, and whips out his sword. So he runs away and all the money from, he made from his, his cloak and everything else was wasted because... He got. He didn't get get his story. That, that's just just one of the chapters in that book. But it illustrates a lot of why you know what the Black Friars had become so fashionable for. Uh, I mean, you go to meet ladies and, and or non ladies, preferably, and all of that sort of thing. If you're a man, and of course, if you're a woman, you go because one of the things we are fairly confident about is that the that the proportion of women in the audience at the Black Friars became very substantial. I mean, if if Henrietta Maria could go, that was the ultimate social cachet, and it was therefore the place to be seen, as well as the place to, to, to see the plays. So that was a major feature of, of how theatre developed um, all that time. I mean, it was the classic, it was the great play of, of, of the 1580s, um, and, and it stayed as a classic all the way through. Hieronimo is Mad Again was a kind of... Um, 
cliche of its time. And of course, Hamlet being mad is in so many ways echoes and builds from the Spanish tragedy um, in, in so many ways. Um, that scene is the key one because it shows the love between Horatio and Belimperia and, um, and the murder of, um, of Horatio by Belimperia's brother, which is, you know, I mean, not exactly a cause of family warmth and intimacy. Um, and, of course, Hieronimo discovering and starting his grieving. I mean, much of the play was famous for the speeches that Hieronimo has about his grief and about the need to take revenge, particularly revenge on the royalty. So re revenge was absolutely classified by that, and the whole idea of a revenge play, revenge tragedy, in which, in the tradition which Hamlet now belongs, um, that really was launched with Hieronimo. It was the first play about the ethics of revenge and what you do with it. We have, we have real problems with the plays because, of course, all we've got is the words. And, and sometimes there are inferences that we have to take from that there were properties of various kinds that go with uh, the things. And, of course, um, for Horatio to be hanged on stage and later in the same play for Pedregano, one of the murderers, to be um, executed, be hanged, in fact, when he believes he's not being hanged. Um, it's a wonderfully ironic sort of aftermath of the Horatio story in that play. But it did require an apparatus in which somebody could be suspended by the neck with, of course, that, that safety strap down the back to, to, to prevent him actually strangling himself. Um, that, that sort of thing clearly was um, a feature, and of course a visual feature of the staging, uh, which everybody, would, everybody who knew the play already would go to it waiting for these moments, these key moments, the murder of Horatio and Hieronimo discovering it and, and all of that. And there are a few illustrations on title pages of plays, like as on the Spanish tragedy, um, but it's, it's never clear just whether they're telling, whether they're reflecting the story or reflecting the staging. Um, I think it's probably more clear in Spanish tragedy because it didn't appear until about the fifth quarter, sixth quarter of the play, um, produced in 1615 or so, uh, um, and, and, and not, as it were, uh, an immediate. I mean, there are other ones where you've got, um, in Philaster, for instance, you've got um, a scene of Philaster wounding his beloved I mean, because he thinks he's betrayed him, all that sort of stuff. Um, but, but there are trees and shrubbery all around which are scenic and therefore two-dimensional and therefore didn't exist on the stage. So we have problems interpreting these. But the Spanish tragedy is one of the most graphic ones because it actually gives you the arbor in which Horatio is, first of all, making love to Belimperia and then being hanged. So it's, it's, it's the clearest evidence we have, almost the clearest single piece of evidence we have, apart from Juliet's bed and one or two other properties that were obviously wheeled onto the stage, um, for anything of how the staging was accom accomplished in those conditions. Richard, of course, is showing his bravado by, by offering the sword to Lady Anne to, to do what she obviously isn't capable of doing. And Richard knows very well she's not capable of that. that but that's part of his, his overpowering of her by his bravado and his acting. It's, it's, it's a beautiful scene of, that, that is absolutely characteristic of the first half of the play, where Richard um, starts prowling around. You know, when he, when he starts the play, for instance, now is the winter hour discontent made glorious summer by this son of York, he's talking directly to the people in the yard around the stage. Um, and that's, that's the direct address, which he continues for half the play, including this bit where he shows himself acting and, and totally disingenuous and, and making a fool of Lady Anne as he makes a fool of Clarence and all the others in the first half of the play. The interesting thing, the most interesting thing from that point of view about Richard III is that his position gets reversed halfway through. When he becomes king, he doesn't prowl around the edges of the stage talking to the audience any longer. He sits in the middle and gets talked to, and, and of course visited by the ghosts and all of those things at the end part of the play. And that makes him a victim instead of a... a, 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 a an agent of, a of action. It's, it's, it also happens with um, Othello, where um, Iago prowls around the edge of the stage doing his soliloquies to the audience, while Othello stands in the middle being made a fool of. 
Um, that's characteristic. And Richard starts making a fool of everybody else and ends up being made a fool of by the different positioning. On the, this is part, of course, of where the three-dimensional staging becomes so important. Eastwood Ho is a lovely, uh, probably one of the best examples of the satirical, cynical satirical play done by the boys. The boys were always, of course, um, because their age expected to be the innocents. You know, I mean, an adult actor might be any sort of villain like Iago or Richard III, um, but the boys were all expected to, to act innocently. And this is the most cynical of all the plays of that period. Um, so it's, it's, it's boys... Um, pretending to be adults and pretending to be um, making fools of themselves in in a way, there's something peculiar about the you know having boy actors. On the one hand, it was socially more respectable to have boy actors than adult actors. Act adult actors were always regarded as quite as corrupt as the people they were picturing in the in the plays. The the boys were innocent of as it were that a total delusion I think, but that was the idea. And um, therefore, the audience would come and enjoy the play as a complete artefact. I mean, the sense of it being non-realistic is actually built into the fact if you've got boys playing men, let alone playing women, um, then it's obviously a fake. It's a show, not a reality. You, do, you, can't, you can't fall for stage realism in the same way. And the whole of Eastwood Ho is based on that assumption. I mean, the most extravagant and idiotic things happen. I mean, the, 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 the idle and industrious apprentice, for instance, which was invented in that play. You've got the two, of, the, the two op, op, opposites um, built into it. And, and the women and their, and their behaviour. It's all part of a game that is going on, and the audience was expected to be sophisticated enough to recognise that it was a game and not a dreadfully realistic story about what might actually happen in the street outside. Um, we, we don't know how the actors were trained, but there is absolutely no doubt that they were very skilled at swordplay. I mean... Uh, Richard Tarleton, the clown from the from the early period, he died in 1588, um, was actually a master of fence, which meant you had to play nine other masters of fence and beat them all in in one afternoon, one, 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 at, at 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 a theatre or wherever you know you could get as a suitable venue. So mastery at fence was clearly one of the actor's skills that that some of them had to had to really involved in. I mean, you'd expect. Laertes and, and, and Hamlet at the end of Hamlet being to be really showing off their, their, their capacities uh, in dueling with one another. Um, and, and the fair quarrel, in a sense, builds on that known expertise. It, was, it, it, it always, of course, would have been an outdoor activity rather than an indoor play activity, uh, even in 1617 or whenever um, the fair quarrel um, came out. Um, but it would have capitalised on the fact that the outdoor playhouses were, like the Swan and others, were regularly used by athletes who would either show off their, 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 their fencing skills or you know, do acrobatics or tightrope walking and things like that. There are, there are quite a few. Even the Globe was rented out in the 1620s and 30s for use by Dutch acrobats and people like that. Um, for shows. So going to a theatre would be not so dissimilar from going to a display of fencing matches. I mean, one hopes that they all had, 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 had um, blunted swords, but I mean, once rapier play, which was characteristic soon after Hamlet was first written, um, that, was, that was very much a, master of really skill, a matter of really skilled fencing. Um, and what, what, what that play is doing, um, what the Fair Quarrel is doing, is utilising fencing as you know, a bravura moment, an exhibition in the play of what you hope is not real, but what it could actually have been simulated as real and quite as exciting as anything, athlete, you know, an athletic competition you went to. Absolutely like that. Um, so it, it, was, it was exploiting and building a story around the idea of a, a quarrel. And of course, a fair quarrel is it's one of the many titles of plays of this part, time that, that is actually a contradiction in terms. It's it, um, like, like The White Devil, um, Webster's play, a fair quarrel. A quarrel that is fair? Well, I mean, 
dueling was actually banned. I mean, for official actual duels were, were totally against the law by, by this time. James was very strong as a man of peace. So he actually denied the possibility of people uh, dueling in order to settle a quarrel. And of course, the assumption that quarrel will decide who's who's the winner and therefore the good person and who's the bad person doesn't make sense anyway, as everybody knew. And there was a, a, very, a great deal written about fencing and dueling as an unfair way of coping with quarrels. So this was, this was the, that, that paradox of fair quarrel in which it's actually, if anything, justified this quarrel. It became the theatre's divided socially and therefore their audiences split out more. Um, they, people, the gentry started writing about um, where we actually have tend to record about citizen playhouses. The ones that went on playing Spanish tragedy and Tamburlaine and Dr. Faustus, um, they were the citizen playhouses, the open air playhouses, the Fortune and the Red Bull in the north, whereas the Blackfriars of course was always doing more radical things, more um, f suited for an audience that the, where the tastes develop more. And in fact, we've got some evidence from the plays themselves about the developing taste. But the real, I would call him the villain of the piece, but other people probably wouldn't. The real character was William Davenant, a fascinating character. He actually claimed to be an illegitimate son of Shakespeare because his mother was a very beautiful innkeeper, a wife of an innkeeper in Oxford. And the assumption was that Shakespeare stayed at the inn on his way up to Stratford. Um, but Davenant was writing plays for the Blackfriars, specifically for the Blackfriars, though one or two of his prefaces indicate that he expects they might also be played at the Globe, but you know, the Blackfriars was clearly his target. And um, in the 1630s, he began to develop towards plays with music and song and dance. In fact, he was in a big scheme in the 1630s, late 1630s for a huge new theatre in Fleet Street with a stage that was 40 foot square, which is um, far bigger than the Globe, you know, the modern Globe, which is a big enough stage. Um, and the idea was that it would be appropriate for music and dancing. You know, in other words, he was inventing the musical and trying to convert his plays into musicals. Um, he actually succeeded in the Restoration. I mean, he had a long, fascinating period um, working against Cromwell. I mean, he, he was gun-running for the Royalists, uh, and then he actually was caught by, by, the, by, by, the, by the, the Navy uh, sailing to Virginia to try and convert the, uh, the colony in Virginia in, into, into Royalists, um, which perhaps mercifully he didn't succeed in doing. Um, and he was brought back and put in the tower, etc. But he was writing plays by the late 1650s. Um, uh, and, and, of course, was one of the two impresarios who was allowed to build his own playhouse and, and open all the new plays in the Restoration. So he was massively influenced in the Restoration. And that's when scenic theatre and musical theatre, I mean, several of Shakespeare's plays were turned into operas. In fact, Davenant invented the word opera he, he used it um, in the 1650s for his, his great play, The Siege of Rhodes, which he was staging in 1658 and 1659, um, because opera was a much more respectable word, being Italian, uh, than play. And play was still regarded as the opposite of work and therefore a bit decadent. So um, he didn't call his Siege of Rhodes a play, he called it an opera. And, and, and he, was, he, he was actually the, the man who introduced musical s scenery, I mean, I'd prefer to call them musicals rather than operas, but nonetheless, that was the trend, and that was the sort of thing that, that Davenant brought in. And he was trying to bring it in uh, in the 1630s before the, before the closure. <laughs>